Okay, sounds good. So before I kick this off, I'm just curious, uh, those of you in the session right now, how many of you guys are familiar with computer vision or convolutional neural networks? Uh, just give me a yes or no uh, in the chat if this is uh, something that you guys are, are familiar with at all. All right, great, great. Um, so a lot of people here are familiar with uh, with with these things. Um, so today's session, it's um, it it is about ResNet. We are going to see ResNet live and in action using the Super Gradients training library. Um, but you know, I, I, it's going to be more than that because I want to talk about. I want to give you a brief history of computer vision and the deep learning revolution before I go into kind of the. Um, the anatomy of a convolutional neural network and you know how convolutional neural networks really revolutionized um you know image classification um so it'll be kind of a history lesson plus a technical lesson plus some coding so i hope you guys are up for that um so look before the deep learning revolution computer vision techniques were uh, often having to rely on handcrafted features, um, you know, combined with classifiers like support vector machines, decision trees, and K nearest neighbors. And these methods, they involve designing and engineering features that could be used to differentiate between different objects or classes in an image, and then training a classifier on top of those features to make predictions. And there's a lot of different uh, methods that were used for designing and engineering features in computer vision before deep learning. Uh, these feature engineering methods were typically performed using a combination of mathematical techniques and algorithms. And some common methods um, before the deep learning revolution include included edge detection, which involved looking for uh, and identifying the boundaries of objects in an image by looking for like a sudden change in pixel intensity. Um, there's also texture analysis, and this involved extracting features from the texture of an image, such as the uh, frequency of different patterns or coarseness of an image. Um, there's also color histograms, and this involved creating a histogram of colors that are present in an image, um, which you could then use to differentiate between objects or classes. Uh, there's also shape analysis, which was extracting features related to the shape of an object or an image, like contours, corners, or curvatures. And there's a couple other methods called uh, SIFT, S-I-F-T, which is Scale Invariant feature transform and this was a method that was uh, used for extracting features from an image uh, that are invariant to changes in scale orientation or transformation and then there was uh, something called surf surf speeded up robust features uh, and it was a method similar to sift um, but the thing is like all of these methods this required a ton of engineering effort. Um, not only did they require domain knowledge and expertise in the field of computer vision, uh, but also in the domain of interest uh, in order to be most effective. And the thing is, the performance of these methods were often limited by the quality of features that were designed. But since the deep learning revolution began in 2012, researchers started using neural networks to automatically learn features uh, directly from raw data. And this allowed uh, researchers and us as an industry to achieve much better performance on a variety of computer vision tasks. And this made it possible to solve problems that were previously thought to be uh, very difficult or nearly impossible. And as a result, deep learning has become the dominant approach for computer vision uh, over the last 10 years. And that is what we are here to talk about today, my friends. So let's go ahead and jump into this. I've got to go ahead and share my screen here. Um, one second. All right. So, my friends, my name is Harpreet Sahota. I am the DevRel Manager at Desi. Um, and we're going to be talking about how ResNet changed deep learning. Uh, if you guys are on Twitter, please do follow me there at Data Science Harp. I share a lot of. Um, just fundamentals of deep learning and then basics of machine learning type of threads and content there every day. So definitely check me out. So the rest of the presentation, what we're going to talk about are typical neural networks. We'll talk about translation invariance, convolutional neural networks, classical convolutional neural network architectures. Then we'll get into ResNet, the residual block and the skip connections. And then we're going to talk about how these inventions changed deep learning forever. And then we're going to see it in action with a coding example. So 
Let's get into it. Let's talk about the anatomy of a convolutional neural network. Uh, but before we do that first, let's just talk about a typical neural network. So suppose that we're interested in classifying images. How would we do that using a neural network? Well, we would have to take our input, uh, we'd have to flatten that into a tensor. We'd then have to pass those values to our input layer. Then we'd have to multiply the weights uh, in the first layer, add a bias, then pass the results to a neuron with some activation function. And then we repeat this loop for each layer in the network. When we're doing it this way, we're essentially passing individual pixels, pixel values to the network. And this leads to a problem because how your network learns becomes very specific. So imagine that you're trying to train a network to recognize pictures of statues. If you train this network on pictures where the statue was near the left of the images, and then later try to generalize uh, to, the net, to, to the network to pictures where statues are in the middle or to the right of an image, chances are the network is not gonna recognize that there's a statue there. And that's because a plain vanilla neural network does not have a property known as translational invariance. But things are different for a CNN. So translational invariance is important because you're more interested in the presence of a feature or rather than where it's located in the image. And translational invariance is what allows a CNN to learn any spatial pattern. So one of the essential characteristics of the convolutional neural network layer is the ability for the feature map to reflect any type of affine transformation uh, that are made to the input image uh, that, that you, you feed into the input layer. So for any shift, tilt, or stretch, or change in the orientation uh, that's made to the input data, the feature map will provide an output that is shifted, tilted, oriented uh, by the amount in the uh, input data was subject to. So once the CNN is trained to detect things in an image, changing the position, shifting, tilting, stretching, or rotating that thing in an image won't prevent the convolutional neural network's ability to detect it. So let's talk about the um, anatomy, the architectural anatomy of, of convolutional neural networks. So there's the convolutional layers, there's activation layers, there's pooling layers, there's dense layers as well. And all of these Lego blocks are kind of combined in various different ways to create a, a network. Um, so let's go ahead and dig into these one at a time. So the first thing we're talking about is the convolutional layer. So instead of flattening the input at the input layer like we would in a typical uh, neural network, we start by applying a filter, right? And you can think of the filter as a window that we slide over small sections of an image from left, uh, sorry, from right to left, from top to bottom, over the entire image. In every one of these filters, we apply a mathematical function that's called a convolution. And so what the convolution is, is a dot product that multiplies the different input values in that filter by some weights, adds up those values, and then outputs one unique value for that window. So this process allows us to move away from individual pixels and into groups of pixels that help the network learn useful features. So this operation is repeated for every section of the image that a filter strides over. So because the filter is typically a smaller size than the whole input image, the same weights can be applied as the filter strides over the entire image. So it turns out that Applying the same filter to the whole image, it helps the network discover important features in the image. And that's because each dot product gives us a notion of similarity, since pixels in an image usually have a stronger relationship with the surrounding pixels than pixels further away. And so we repeat this process several times, and we end up with a compressed version of our data that's uh, called a feature map. So when the input has more than one channel, for example, like a red, green, blue image, just a typical color image, uh, the filter needs to have a matching number of channels. Um, so you calculate the output the same way before. So we perform the convolution on each channel, add the results together, and then the result we have is a two-dimensional array that's called a feature map of output values that represent a filtering of the input. Um, 
And you can also apply multiple filters and convolutional layer to detect multiple features. And again, the output of, of the layer will have the same number of channels as the number of filters in the layer. So we talked about the convolution operation or the convolutional layers. Now let's talk about activation layers. So the activation layers takes the resulting feature maps and applies a nonlinear activation function. Uh, this nonlinearity is uh, a must. We need this so that we're able to approximate complex functions. So whatever the output is from the previous layer, we apply one of these activation functions, typically it's the ReLU, to, uh, to each element. So there's no learning really happening in this layer, um, but it's still an essential component of the CNN architecture. Uh, so once we have a feature map that's been passed an activation function, it's typically gonna be followed up by a pooling layer. And so pooling layers help reduce the size of our problem space and it's essentially dimensionality reduction uh, also called downsampling so it works by taking a grid of pixels and reducing them to a single value for feature layers to receive as input so in the example here for each two by two grid of pixels the pixels with the maximum value is kept so one main benefit of a pooling layer is that it helps control overfitting by reducing the number of parameters and computation in the network. So the choice of pooling operation is made based on uh, the data that you have on hand. Um, you know, there's, there's average pooling that you can use and average pooling will smooth out the image. Uh, and so when you smooth out the image, sharp features might not be identified when you use that method. Uh, whereas max pooling, selects brighter pixels uh, from the image and helps in extracting like lower level features like edges or, or points. And then the other component of convolutional neural networks, the other part of its anatomy is the dense layer. Um, so typically by the end of this cycle of convolution, activation, pooling, the image has now been filtered, corrected, and reduced. Uh, so then we then flatten our output and pass it to a series of fully connected or dense layers. So the dense layers of the CNN take the input uh, vector or tensor of the uh, flattened pixels of an image. And then we apply a softmax function at the output of the dense layers uh, to provide a probability that the image belongs to a, a certain class. Um, so these are kind of the core building blocks of a convolutional neural network. Um, are there any questions at this point? Because now what we're going to do is we're going to see how these different building blocks, these different Lego pieces are put together. And we'll talk about some classical convolutional neural network architectures. Um, so let me know if there are any questions. I am not seeing any questions right now, but maybe maybe somebody's typing. Um, um, I just want to call out uh, Roman, Roman, who, uh, when you asked if anybody was familiar with CNNs, or, um, um, he said it, uh, or they said it depends on the definition of familiar with. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, again, I'm not seeing any questions come in yet. So why don't we go ahead and continue and then... Uh, we can stop, or I should say, now there's questions. <laughs> okay, great, um, great. So, are weights and feature map <laughs> values different? Um, yes, the, the the weights are what you're multiplying the input by to get the feature map. So there are different different things. So, uh, after you take an image, multiply it by some weights, that result is a feature map. Okay. Um, uh, and then how do you keep a sense of the robustness of the outcomes? Um, uh, I'm assuming they're talking about how well the model is able to generalize, um, if that's what they mean. Um, you know, you look at whatever typical metrics that you're looking at. Like if, if you're doing, for example, we're typically doing classification, um, you look to, to see if, if you're... Uh, training loss, uh, you know, if, uh, how that is behaving, um, and then compare that to whatever your testing loss is and, and see if it's uh, <laughs> if it's behaving erratically um, or not. Um, but that'd be one one method. Okay, perfect. And we're going to go through two more questions. So um, sure. this person says, great intro. Um, activation functions typically on the, uh, I hope I'm saying this right, on the neuron and not a separate layer. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. 
answer is yes. <laughs> okay. And then um, um, uh, last question before we move on. Uh, since different pooling techniques have different strengths, would you would you ensemble methods with different convolutional windows and pooling methods? Uh, typically, max pooling is is pooling that's used most frequently. Um, but you know, you find out through experimentation. Uh, you can play around with with different pooling layers and see how they work. But typically, max pooling is the one that's most commonly used. Okay, sounds good. Um, we had one last question slide in, so I'll ask this one and then we'll move on. Um, what okay. is slash are the benefits of a stride greater than one? How about padding the edges? Yeah, so you can use a stride greater than one. Uh, if, if you want to, the output, the, the resulting feature map will be smaller in size. Um, so, you know, it depends. You, you, can, you can have a greater, like, if you want to downsample the image, you can have a greater stride. Um, so I guess there's some choices you can make there in the architecture design. You could either use max pooling to do downsampling, or you can use a uh, uh, a greater stride to do downsampling. Um, padding is used when kind of like the the shape of your uh, the kernel, the size of your filter. Um, like if you're if if as you move across the image you run out of space at the edge of the image, then you can pad it with the zeros um, so that we can maintain that that same kind of uh, size of the, the output mm -hmm. filter. Okay, sounds good. That's all our questions for now. So let's cool. continue and I'll see you again later. Cool. So the first classical architecture we're going to talk about is uh, Lynette. Lynette. So this strongly influenced the deep learning community and it was introduced by Jan LeCun. Uh, in the classic 1998 paper, uh, Gradient-Based Learning Applied to Document Recognition. Uh, it's the first convolutional neural network uh, that used backpropagation. Uh, here what we have is a Lynette 5 architecture, which uh, where 5 is the number of layers. And uh, you can think of this architecture as consisting of uh, two parts, an encoder uh, consisting of two convolutional layers and then a dense block consisting of three fully connected layers. And it was uh, originally used for uh, uh, handwritten digit recognition. And uh, it, you know, it beat all the existing methods at the time. Um, compared to, you know, a lot of the modern methods of today, Lynette is quite simplistic. Uh, it's just five layers that are composed of uh, five by five convolutions and, you know, two by two max pooling. Uh, but this simplistic architecture paved the way for computer vision as we know it today. Uh, then we have uh, AlexNet, and AlexNet is really what brought about the deep learning revolution. Um, you know, so after Lynette was introduced in 1995, CNNs were well known in in computer vision and machine learning communities, but they didn't dominate the field the way that they do today. Um, and that's until 2012 when AlexNet hit the scene. So this new uh, architecture really it demonstrated unparalleled performance on the largest image data set of the time called uh, ImageNet. And AlexNet is considered to be the father of the modern convolutional neural network. And in a lot of ways, it's an evolution of Lynette and is uh, widely acknowledged as the first successful application of deep learning. Um, so the architecture is comprised of eight layers in total. The first five are convolutional layers, and the last three are fully connected layers. Uh, these layers all have the same basic building blocks that we've discussed, convolutions, max pooling, dense layers, so on and so forth. Uh, the first two convolutional layers are connected uh, to overlapping max pooling layers to, um, you know, extract a minimum, max, sorry, maximum number of features. Uh, third and Third, fourth, and fifth convolution layers are directly connected to the fully connected layers. Um, and all the outputs of the uh, convolutional and fully connected layers are then you know, connected to the ReLU uh, nonlinear activation function. So the final output uh, is connected to a softmax activation layer, which uh, produces distribution over 1,000 class labels. Um, so we can see that AlexNet took the insights of Lynette to the next level, and it resulted in a wider and deeper neural network. Uh, the success of AlexNet is a key step in moving from shallow networks to deeper networks, because for the first time, it offered empirical evidence that deep convolutional neural networks can achieve amazing results. Um, 
the next classic architecture is VGG16. So as good as AlexNet was, it didn't give us a template to design new networks. Um, so the Visual Geometry Group at Oxford VGG introduced the idea of using blocks um, with the VGG family of networks. So one VGG block consisted of a sequence of convolution layers followed by a max pooling layer for downsampling. So group this, this grouping of convolutions into blocks is a pattern now that's remained almost unchanged over the last decade. Um, and it also was the first uh, uh, architecture to demonstrate, or sorry, introduce the concept of defining a family of similar models. Uh, so it gives the practitioner the trade-off between complexity and speed. Um, and you know, in, in addition to, to the idea of using blocks, uh, VGG uh, also introduced the idea of chaining multiple 3x3 three three convolutions together. Um, and this reduces the <coughs> amount of parameters that uh, that need to be learned uh, and also increases the receptive field of the convolution. Um, but that, that could be lecture in itself. Uh, but VGG showed that deep and narrow networks significantly outperformed the uh, shallow counterparts. Um, so if you're interested, I, I've got a YouTube video I can share with you all later um, that talks about this. That's quite interesting. So this trend of deeper and deeper networks carried on uh, with you know the network and network network in network architectures and the Google Net architectures and what happened was it set the deep learning community on a quest for increasingly deeper networks. Uh, but it turns out though that learning better networks is not as easy as stacking more and more layers together. And that's for a couple of reasons. The first is the vanishing gradient and exploding gradient problem. Uh, the net result of both of these scenarios is that the early layers in a network uh, become more difficult to train. And the reason for this issue is that parameters in the earlier layers of a network are far away from the cost function at the end. So the cost function is actually the source of the gradient that is propagated back through the network. So as the air is back propagated through an ever increasingly deeper network, a larger number of parameters contribute to the error. And so this causes earlier layers uh, closer to the input to get smaller and smaller updates. And this is due to the chain rule. So the chain rule multiplies error gradients for weights in the network and uh, multiplying lots of values that are uh, less than one results in smaller and smaller values. So when the gradient be, you know, ends up coming to the first layer, the value could go to zero. And then the inverse problem is the exploding gradient problem, which happens when large error gradients accumulate during training. So we're multiplying lots of numbers greater than one. Um, and the end result is like a massive update to the model weights in the earlier layers. But there's another more curious problem, and this is the degradation problem. So as you're adding more and more layers to these deep networks, uh, it actually ends up leading to higher training errors. Um, and this is an unexpected problem because it's not caused by overfitting. So it's not a problem of having too many parameters. Um, overfitting would be when the training error is lower or as low, uh, and then the test error goes up. Uh, so this is what's called the so-called degradation problem. Um, so researchers are finding that as networks got deeper, the training loss would decrease up to some saturation point, but then shoot back up as more layers were added to the network. Um, and the network's performance, overall performance dropped as the model complexity increased. And this is counterintuitive because you would expect that your training error would decrease and you know converge and plateau out as the number of layers in your network increases. So let's kind of think about this a little bit. So imagine that we had a shallow network, network one here, that was performing well. So the idea is if you take a shallow network and just stack on more layers to create a deep ne deeper network, then the performance of the deeper network should be at least as good as the shallow network. Why is that? Well, because in theory, the deeper network could learn the shallow network, right? The shallow network is a subset of the deeper network. But this doesn't happen in practice. You can even set the new layers that you stack to be identity layers, 
right? To just, you know, essentially just multiply by one. And you could, you would still find that the training error gets worse when you stack more layers on top of the shallower model. Um, so researchers were finding that deeper networks were leading to higher training error. But in 2015, a paper was published by Kai Ming He called Deep Residual Learning for Image Recognition and It Changed Deep Learning Forever. Uh, it's one of the most influential papers in deep learning and it attacked the problem of how to construct a deeper network architecture that can perform as well or at least the same as shallower networks. And at the heart of this problem is an elegant solution to the degradation problem. And this is the problem residual networks aim to solve. Um, and that breakthrough that they came up with was called the skip connection. So skip connections allow you to take the activation value from an earlier layer and pass it to deeper layers in the network. So this allows for a smoother f uh, flow of gradients and it ensures that important features are preserved in the training process. And these skip connections are housed inside of what's called residual blocks or residual models. So let's talk a little bit more about how these residual blocks work. So on the left, we have a traditional kind of network, traditional framework where the output from the previous block gets passed directly to the next block as the input. On the right, you have the residual block. And here's how it works. So instead of the previous layer's output being passed directly to the next block, uh, we take a copy of that output, and then that copy is passed through a residual block, and then the residual block will process the copied output matrix. Um, you know, let's say that let's say that it's going through a three by three convolution, followed by bash norm and relu, and it, you get some other matrix at the end called Z. Um, and then we take the original matrix X, and we take that matrix that's gone through the block, and we just add them together element by element. Um, and this is what then gets passed to the next layer and block. And so these residual blocks with the skip connections allow us to do two very important things. Um, first is avoids the problem of vanishing or exploding gradients. Uh, the way it does this is by creating an alternate path for the gradient to flow through. Second is that it ena enables models to learn an identity function. So this allows a deeper layer to perform as well as an earlier layer, or at the very least, it won't perform any worse. And that's because when BRAC propagation is done uh, through some identity function, the gradients can just can be multiplied by one. Uh, so the end result is that the residual blocks either learn something useful and contribute to reducing the error of the network, or they perform identity mapping and do nothing at all. And because of these two facts, uh, the loss surface of a neural network with skip connections is smoother than the one without. And it works because each layer is trying to reduce its own contribution to the final error while participating in the network made up of all the other layers. So the skip connection is part of the network. So the layer learns it doesn't need to process uh, the parts of the tensor that doesn't change. Uh, this makes the, that layer's job simpler. It enables it to be smaller, and it, it leads to faster convergence than the network without any skip connections. Which in turn means that we're able to build deeper networks. So in fact, the ResNet family has, in, uh, has ushered in an era of ever increasingly deeper networks. And they range from 18 layers to over 1,000 layers. So the common ResNet architectures are ResNet 34. Uh, this was presented in the original paper. Um, there's also ResNet 50, ResNet 101, ResNet 152. Um, and here on this picture is what's, the, what's called the ResNet 50. Um, and so the building blocks is just modified into um, a, a bottleneck design that, uh, you know, due to concerns over the time it takes to train the layers. But uh, essentially, it's the, the you know that allows us to build <laughs> increasingly deeper deeper networks so so in summary just uh closing all this up before we go look at some coding uh we see skip connections used everywhere uh in all parts of computer vision ranging from image classification to detection and segmentation uh it's used in architectures like densenet unet and it's even used in transformers um so you know it, it turns out 
that building networks isn't as easy as stacking more and more layers together because then we run into two problems, the vanishing gradient and the degradation problem. Skip connections help address both of these problems. And we now see skip connections everywhere in deep learning from Im image classification to transformers. Um, so now let's just look at a quick example of, uh, of, of ResNet. Um, and we'll do that now. Uh, before we do that, wait, are there any questions or anything? Um, there is a question that re kind of refers back to that first part when we were going over uh, CNNs and how, they, how they're structured and how they work. Um, mm -hmm. Can you apply, apply this to time series forecasting? Convolutions? Um, it's a good question. I've, I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I'm not sure if this can be applied to, uh, to time series forecasting. I know that uh, convolutions have their place in graph neural networks. There's the graph convolution networks, but I'm mm -hmm. um, not sure for time series. All right. um, and is now a good time to share that document with everyone? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Um, you guys have the link, right? Yep, yep, it's being shared okay. out right now. Um, and it looks like we have uh, a couple more questions. So, so while we're answering questions, I know there's a there's a Google Colab that's going out. Um, so if you want to follow along with this this upcoming part, uh, you know, get that open, and we'll answer some questions to give you some time to open that. So, um, first question: What constitutes a, a VGG block? Is it convo plus convo plus is that uh, plus max pool? It's in the chat if you want to open that up. <laughs> yeah, so uh, so VG16, there's 13 convolutional layers, five max pooling layers, and three dense layers. Um, so it adds up to like 21 layers, but max pooling layers don't really learn any parameters, so we don't count them. Um, and so what it does is it, it chains multiple 3 by 3 convolutions together, and this just reduces the amount of, of parameters. So um, I will send you, like I promised, the link to this awesome YouTube video that, that talks, uh, talks a lot about that. Um, yeah, uh, when applying a deep neural network, is the pattern always block followed by skip connections, then block again? Uh, not, not always. Um, not always. Depends on, on the architecture, uh, obviously. Okay, perfect. Um, cool. And I, I think that's the only Great. question so why don't you go ahead and we can get started with this and um again you'll see me when we have questions great um so we are going to be uh looking at um uh resnet just kind of seeing it in action um not doing like live coding per se but we are doing coding walkthrough um so i'm going to increase the size of the font here let me know if that font size works for you guys Is it everybody able to see this okay? I mean, I'm, I'm seeing see. it all right, so I'm assuming all everybody right, else can as well. Great, cool, cool. If you guys need me to make the the, the font bigger, I could I could zoom in. Um, but we're gonna see ResNet in action using uh, super gradients, and um, I'll just kind of step through the code, walk through the code. Um, so first, super gradients is a uh, it's a training library. Let me pull it up and just show you guys. Um, it's a PyTorch based training library, and it supports um, all the major computer vision tasks with more being added soon. Um, we've got a robust model zoo. Um, we've got a number of uh, classification models pre-trained here, uh, as well as object detection and semantic segmentation. Uh, we're also going to be supporting um, some new tasks in the near future, um, but it's kind of a one-stop shop for uh, for for computer vision. Um, so definitely check it out. I'll drop a link into the chat for Super Gradients, and uh, if you wouldn't mind smashing a star on that, I would be greatly appreciative. Uh, it's an open source training library, so um, we're looking for contributors as well. So if you'd like to contribute, do let us know. All right, so the first thing we do is uh, install Super Gradients. Um, so when you install Super Gradients, um, it'll take a couple minutes to install. Um, just, um, you know, as soon as you install it, just make sure you restart the kernel or, uh, or the runtime um, and then go on to the imports. Otherwise, you'll get into an error. So we'll import 
the uh, kind of standard libraries that we're going to use for this particular example. And this example, we're going to use the many places data set. Um, so the many places data set is this guy. Let me just move something out of the way here. So the many places, uh, it's a image classification benchmark for education of deep learning computer vision. And essentially, it's it's got a hundred different uh, uh, labels um, of just different places, uh, different different places, uh, different types of places. So we'll, we'll look at this in, in, in a second here. Um, but we're just going to download that directly from um, uh, from Torch Vision, uh, and that'll get downloaded right here into our directly data sets, many places, uh, split into image folder format, which is uh, quite nice. And we can look at the different classes that we're trying to uh, classify here. And just to look at, you know, for example, um, it's not let me uh, look at it, open it up right now, but um, we'll, we'll examine some pictures in a second. Uh, next is just a configuration class. This is just makes it easy for us to um, have kind of the uh, different variables in, in one place. Um, so that's what this is doing. So the first thing that we do in Super Gradients is initialize the trainer. So the trainer is in charge of pretty much everything from training, evaluating, saving checkpoints, plotting, so on and so forth. Um, so the experiment name argument is uh, very important. And you can see here that we defined it up here in the config. Um, so we call trainer and pass the experiment name, uh, give it the checkpoints roots and the device that we're going to be using. So Super Gradients uh, is a PyTorch-based training library, so it's compatible with Torch data loaders. Um, so you can use your own data loaders as uh, as you'd like. Um, and so that's what this function is doing here. It's just creating a data loader. And what we're going to be doing is um, uh, creating data loaders for our training and validation set. Next is uh, image augmentations that, that we'll do. Um, so we'll define image augmentations. Uh, in the notebook itself, I've uh, given you some heuristics that you can consider when selecting image augmentations for uh, image classification tasks. General rule of thumb is just start with basic augmentations. Um, so it's a good idea to start with basic augmentations like horizontal flipping, vertical flipping, rotation. Uh, so these augmentations kind of help uh, the model learn basic features uh, and, and invariance, but just kind of be mindful of the type of flipping that you're doing, right? So we're looking at places, right? We're looking at pictures of places. So it's unlikely that the data that we that we get in the real world is going to have like upside down places, right? So um, you know, while horizontal flipping might be a good choice, I probably wouldn't use vertical flipping uh, in in this case. Rotations, I think that would be fine as well. Um, but these type of uh, basic augmentations are useful when you're uh, working with images that have kind of like a clear dominant orientation, like a photograph. Uh, you could add noise to uh, to this. It helps the model learn more robust features. Um, and that's useful when you're working with images that might be noisy or have low signal to noise ratio. Um, there's also geometric transformations, scaling, translation, cropping. Um, and these are helpful when you're working with images uh, that have multiple objects of different sizes and, and scales. Um, random crop seems to be a augmentation, cropping augmentation that works really well. Uh, you can use color variations, uh, so you can vary the color of an image, um, and that's you know playing around with the brightness, contrast, and hue of an image. Uh, it's useful when you're working with images that got like a wide range of colors, like a, like landscape or, or uh, photographs. Um, you know, domain-specific augmentations as well. Um, but just keep in mind that um, don't use all augmentations at the same time. Just try using a few augmentations and see how it affects the performance of your model. Um, so I en encourage you to, to experiment with uh, different augmentations here. I'll put that here, different augmentations. Um, so you can look at, uh, I'm just using standard uh, augmentations from Torch Vision. Um, so you can go to Torch Vision Transforms, and you can get a list of the different types of transformations right here. Um, you'll notice that uh, all I'm doing is resizing, doing a horizontal flip, a rotate, and a random crop. Um, but I would encourage you to uh, to play around with some of the other transformations and see how you how you fare with that. 
Um, so we will go ahead and create our data loaders. Um, that's what this is doing here. Um, so we're using this function up above that we'd already defined up here. And to this function, we pass in the directory of the training data, the directory of validation data. We give the transformations for the training data and the you know transformations for the validation data. For the validation data, the only transformations we're going to do is uh, just make sure it's the appropriate size, and we're going to scale it to the uh, ImageNet um, mean standard deviation. Other than that, we don't apply any more uh, transforms to the validation data. Uh, we also pass in our batch size and the number of workers. So number of CPUs that we're using. So that's what these are here. Um, and so all of these, we've already defined them in the uh, configuration class. So we've got 100,000 samples in the training set, uh, 10,000 samples in the validation, and we have 100 labels that we are going to attempt to classify. Um, so here are some images. These are images from the uh, training set. Uh, these are images that have already been uh, through the augmentations as well, just to kind of look at them. And you can see the types of uh, images that we're working with here. And from the validation set, you can see here that the only thing we've done with these images is scale the uh, mean and standard deviation of the pixels to the Im image net mean and standard, standard deviation. And we're going to be performing transfer learning in this case. So um, because we're performing transfer learning using a pre-trained model, um, you know, there's some heuristics that I've, that I've laid out for you here. Um, I know that we're running short on time, so I'm going to leave the reading of these heuristics up to you. Um, but keep in mind that we're going to go with option two. Why option two? Because we've got a, a fairly large data set, and our data set is similar to the data set that the model was pre-trained on. Um, so what we're going to do is going to freeze the earlier layer weights and then retrain the later layer weights uh, with a new fully connected layer. So super gradients. Uh, it's awesome because it has a lot of different architectures that have already been implemented. And one of them is the ResNet 50 architecture. Um, and again, this will link you to that paper, ResNet 50 paper. Um, and you can also see the implementation here. So this is the uh, implementation behind the scenes that SuperGradients is using for ResNet um, with all its different uh, building block pieces. And it's abstracted away from you, the user, making it a bit easier for you to use. Um, and we're also going to use the uh, SuperGradients uh, training recipes. So the training recipes is just a combination of data sets, the architecture, training hyperparameters, and various checkpoints. Um, so you can learn more about what a training recipe is and how to use it here. So I'll go ahead and drop a link here. Um, Right, so we'll go ahead and instantiate the model. So all we have to do here, um, you'll see the number of classes. Uh, remember that the number of classes was defined, we got it up front from the data loader, and that in this case, so ImageNet itself was uh, trained on 1,000 classes. Our classes that we're training on are only 100. Um, so all you have to do to super gradients is just tell it the number of classes and it'll change the classification head for you automatically. You don't have to do anything, just give it the number of classes that we're working with. And that's what's happening here. And we'll use uh, Torch Summary to just look at the uh, layers. So uh, if you want to inspect this a bit further, you can you can see the different layers and, and kind of how, how they work and how uh, these are all kind of put together and stacked together to form the, the residual network here. Um, so that's this part. <coughs> and so I'm just going to free some of the earlier layers here. Um, that's what's going on here. Um, you can experiment with it. I encourage you to experiment to with experiment this. Try, try to run this without uh, freezing any layers. Um, it might take a little bit more time, but, but give it a shot. See what happens. Try freezing only one layer. Try freezing, you know, uh, all layers except the classification head, kind of just see how it goes, um, just to play around and, and see what you come up with. Um, so in this case, like, I'm freezing uh, just the first few layers here. Um, and we can see here that trainable is now set to false, meaning that these are now frozen layers. So frozen layers, what that means is that um, during training, as when BRAC propagation happens, these weights that we have here will not receive any updates. Um, 
So that's essentially what freezing does. Freezing means that during back propagation, um, those weights will not be trained. So we mentioned the different training recipes for super gradients. Um, and these are all uh, stored in these training hyperparameters. And you can take a look at all these different um, hyperparameters that we've found to work really well. Um, so we've kind of done a lot of the heavy lifting for you in that respect and kind of found a great uh, set of um, training parameters that work well on ImageNet. And uh, you can overwrite some of these parameters. Um, so for example, um, we're going to override a couple here. Uh, I only trained for three epochs because I didn't want to spend uh, all day training this model. Um, so that, you know, that's why I look set it to you can definitely change it play around with it see how long it'll take um, I'm also setting exponential moving average to true so exponential moving average is just a training uh, trick kind of uh, it's used to smooth out fluctuations in the training process of these deep neural networks and it works by just taking a moving average of the models parameters uh, with more weight given to recent updates uh, so it helps reduce the noise in the training process and improves the stability of the model um, and then I'm also, uh, with this line here, I'm enabling label smoothing. Uh, so label smoothing is a regularization technique um, that's uh, used for classification problems that prevent the model from predicting the training examples too confidently. Um, so this makes uh, more robust classification. So super gradient is nice because you can see it's just, just a, like a, a flip of a switch that I'm able to turn this on. I don't have to write any additional code to make this happen or make this happen. Uh, it's just a flip of a switch. Um, so that's kind of like a, a nice feature that we've done to help shorten the development time for you. All right, so now we're gonna talk about training and evaluation and we'll look at this in a second. So SuperGradius is gonna track a few different metrics for us. Accuracy, label smoothing, cross entropy, and top five. Accuracy, I think we all understand this fairly well, so I'm not gonna talk too much about that. Let's talk about label smoothing cross entropy. So in classification problems, sometimes your model is going to learn uh, to predict the training examples with extreme confidence, but that's not good for generalization. So the effect of label smoothing is that it's gonna reduce the confidence of the model in its predictions, um, and that will help prevent overfitting and improve the model's ability to generalize to new unseen data. So this is um, often used with other you know, different uh, regularization techniques like weight decay and dropout um, that helps improve the generalization of the model. Top five accuracy, and that's actually gonna be the accuracy that we're gonna be most concerned with for, for this demo. Uh, top five accuracy just means that one of the model's top five highest probability predictions match the ground truth. If it does, we count that as a correct prediction. And I think that's a, it's reasonable to use that in this case because first of all, we're classifying 100 different classes, right? Um, and I'm only training for three epochs um, and, you know, not, not employing too many different tricks. So top five, I think, is a reasonable uh, metric to watch for. And now this is, you know, this makes it easy. You don't have to write the, the training and evaluation loop yourself. Um, if you guys are familiar with PyTorch, uh, you know that this could easily be about 100 lines of, of code by the time you're done with it. Um, but all we do is to the trainer object that we've defined, we... Uh, in, you know, invoke the train method, pass in the model name, pass in the training parameters, which is this uh, the dictionary that we had just defined there. Uh, we give the training loader and the validation data loader as well. And SuperGradients just trains it all for you, and you get this nice printout after every epoch, just kind of telling you the current state of training, so you're able to, to keep an eye on that. So again, I only train for three epochs just um, for the sake of, of time. And... Um, it'll give you the summary of, of epochs, give you the best one up until now, um, so on and so forth. So after three epochs, I was able to uh, get a top five accuracy of uh, 0.9115. Not too bad, not terrible. Um, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, yeah, 0.915. So this gives you the best until now, um, and you can see here that it, it keeps track, keeps memory of, of the best one for you. Um, we'll go ahead and just call the best model this. We'll just uh, pass in this one line of code um, and then just evaluating the, um, 
you're just verifying that this was actually the accuracy I'm just testing that best model on the validation data set and I'm looking at accuracy in top five and you can see here that the best till now accuracy matches <coughs> and best till now top five matches as well and that's it we've trained ResNet we've, <laughs> we've seen ResNet in action here um, and we can see how well it uh, predicts now on some images from the validation set so this function here is just going to predict and plot some images for us um, so I'm I'm going to look at 30 images here I'll zoom in a bit more here um, and you can see that um, the ground truth and the prediction and the probability um, so you can see some interesting you can almost kind of see how the model might you know for example this is a driveway but it predicted a rainforest well look around there's a bunch of trees um, you can see here auditorium predicted that correctly uh, the ground truth of this was yard but it predicted a botanical garden well I could see why it might have done that um, you know this the ground truth is an auditorium but it's predicted classroom um, I think this looks more like a crap classroom anyways um, but you can go through here and you can kind of look at uh, you know how the model is performing um, and this is just after three epochs um, which I thought was was great uh, to see really interesting to see so not not too bad um, then we can predict on unseen images so this is a uh, random picture that I picked from the internet uh, it's random but it just so happens to be my absolute favorite TV show uh, the office so I just passed you the picture of the office and you can see here that I was able to classify it as as an office uh, and I gave it a picture of uh, my absolute favorite sports team which is San Francisco 49ers and it was able to classify that as a football stadium as well um, this right here is a food court and I was able to classify that correctly as well uh, so I encourage you to play around with uh, with this as well uh, try to pass in different image paths and, and see how it goes um, so that brings us uh, to the hour um, I didn't think I'd make it on time, but I'm glad we did. Uh, so definitely go ahead, check it out. Give us a star on uh, on GitHub if you found this uh, training library to be cool. Um, Super Gradients, PyTorch-based training library, and it's um, it's really just helps. Um, it helps to uh, shorten your development time for sure. Um, that being said, I'm going to look at some of the questions that I saw funneling in here. Um, Great. Yeah, we have a few questions. Um, the first. Um, is kernel a type of hyperparameter which changes after each backdrop? Uh, so kernel is not a hyperparameter. So the kernel is just the filter that is being learned. So it's a learned uh, parameter of the of the model. Um, so it's a learned parameter of the model. Um, why is it called residual network? Um, it's because of that skip connection because we're taking like the value and um, we're adding it to the you know the uh, transformed value so like it's kind of being residual in that sense so residual network is because we're, we're you know the residual that we're keeping is is the original values um, mm -hmm. so hopefully that that makes sense and then um, uh, my favorite question so far in 2023 what's going wrong if we get 100% accuracy <laughs> you might have data leakage um, I think that might be the uh, uh, the issue there <laughs> if you get 100% accuracy um, so I definitely look out for for that um, yeah my, okay, perfect. That, then, be my, my first guess and then can you clarify the relationship between ResNet and ImageNet um, is this a version of ResNet model pre-trained with ImageNet data set then is it further trained with another image data set for cl classification yeah so uh, ImageNet is a is a data set um, so a huge data set first of its kind um, so ImageNet is, is that it is a data set that's used as a benchmark to assess how well uh, architectures perform on image classification tasks so that's what ImageNet is the data set mm -hmm. ResNet is just a type of architecture um, so ResNet was submitted in 2015 for the ImageNet competition and it won in that year so hopefully that clarifies the question um, so this version of model pre-trained with the ImageNet data set and then further trained with another image data set for classification. Yeah, so the 
ResNet model that we have here was pre-trained on ImageNet. Um, so we took that pre-trained model and then we did some transfer learning. Uh, as you saw here, I, I froze a couple of the first layers, uh, froze some early layers, and uh, retrained in our new data set. Um, you know, after uh, yeah, after freezing some layers. So and then there, our, there's our actually friend. there's yeah, sorry, sorry, just real quick on ImageNet. I was listening to this amazing um, this podcast episode. It's called the Robot Brains Podcast, and um, there was an episode with Fei Fei Li who was the creator of ImageNet, and she talks about this history of, of ImageNet, and uh, I just thought it was amazing. Uh, beautiful, beautiful episode. Um, I'll, I'll pull it up as he asks this next question. Okay. So, so our friend Sean says, how long do you train when testing different hyperparameters? Will better ones train faster always? Uh, how long do you train when testing different hyperparameters? Um, I mean, that depends on the architecture, the size of the data set. Um, it depends on a lot. Uh, will better ones train faster always? Uh, I don't, I don't, I mean, always is a strong word, so uh, I, I would say not always. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't have a, a better answer for you, Sean. Uh, sorry about that. Okay, and uh, while you look up that podcast, I'm actually going to introduce our, uh, our webinars for next week because we are done with questions. So... Um, so thank you all for joining today. Uh, we do have a couple of webinars coming up next week, and I'm just sharing my screen here so that uh, we can take a little peek at them. Uh, so uh, on January 10th at 9 a.m. Pacific, which is a little early for me, but we'll get there, uh, we'll have MySQL up and running in 30 minutes with Sergey. And Sergey, I apologize if I, <laughs> if I say your last name wrong. I think it's Kuzmichev. And uh, again, um, uh, I apologize to this person if I pronounced their name wrong as well. Uh, Vinicius Grippa, um, they're co-authors of Learning MySQL. Um, and so what we're going to do in this one is we're going to set up a playground with a MySQL database. Um, we're going to go over some other things as well. We're going to make sure we understand everything around it. And then we're going to get something set up and be able to play with it. Um, so that'll be January 10th at 9 a.m. Pacific. And you can RSVP just on our website or in, join us on one of our live streams. And then the following day, the very next day, January 11th, we'll be building and deploying a model using AutoML in Azure. And this will be with one of Data Science Dojo's data scientists, Arham Noman. Um, and we'll be doing exactly what the title says. We're going to be building and deploying a model using AutoML. Um, and that is January 11th at 11 a.m. Pacific. And um, again, you can RSVP on our website or join us on one of our live streams. We'd love to see you there. Um, all right. And... Uh, Harpreet, did you find that that uh, that podcast episode that you were mentioning? Yeah, yeah, I've dropped a link for that right there Perfect. in the, uh, all the right. chat. Uh, so thank you all for being here today. Big thanks to Harpreet. We loved having you. Um, uh, we'll make sure that uh, this recording gets up on, on, we'll have it on Data Science Dojo's YouTube channel as well as datasciencedojo.com slash tutorials. And then um, all of the links that you saw here today, we will definitely have added as a resource. Uh, give Harpreet uh, a follow on Twitter there. Um, he's a great, great follow. I follow him on my personal account. Um, and uh, we hope to see you next week, January 10th, as well as January 11th. Um, Harpreet, you have any last, any last words for everyone? Uh, no, thanks. Thanks for uh, hanging out, y'all. Appreciate you guys uh, sticking with me. Um, you know, there's, we covered a lot in one hour. Uh, so, um, if there are questions remaining, if there's you know some things that click in your mind um, that you want to ask, feel free to send me a message, whether it's uh, on LinkedIn or on Twitter or just to my email, harpreet.sahoda at desi.ai. Um, if you got questions, I'd be happy to, happy to take those. All right. Everybody have a good rest of their week. See you later. Bye. Bye.